turning in your Bible with me to the book of Acts chapter 4, please. We'll be looking at just verse 47 this morning for our jump on verse. While you're turning there, I'll tell you, uh, no doubt a little fun this morning. I, I like to, uh, to have fun and, and with a serious subject, of course, because everything that we talk about is serious, right? But we can have some fun with it. You know, I was thinking this week, I don't get a chance to watch much television. Quite frankly, most of it on there doesn't have very many redeeming qualities anyway. Amen. But uh, one show that I watch every time it comes on, I set the recorder to record it, is called Mountain Men. Well, if any of you watch Mountain Men, uh, I, I like it. I, I'm not endorsing it. I just enjoy it. I like to, to see how the, the show follows the life of, uh, of different groups of people as they... Uh, uh, live and survive in, in mountainous environments and stuff. Well, anyway, a couple of the guys that are featured on there are trappers, all right? And, uh, you know, all of them do it a little bit. A couple of them do it for a living. They, they, they trap animals for a living. And, uh, and so by watching the show, de facto, I've learned how to trap. Now, I've never trapped much myself other than the possums trying to get in my chicken pen, and they make it real easy because the possums, they must not be very smart. But uh, because I'm not really not a very good trapper. But let me tell you, and, and watch, I'll make sense of this in a few minutes, I promise. <laughs> this is this is extra information. You didn't know you were gonna learn this when you came to church this morning. But here's here's how to trap. Five step plan. Number one, you've got to place your trap in an area where animals are. Number two, disguise the trap. Number three, you bait. Number four, you make a funnel. To get the animals to come to the trap. And number five, check it often so you don't lose your animal. Simple as that. Now let me tell you why I was why I was thinking about trapping this morning. Because this week I was thinking about what's our church's mission for 2019 gonna be? What is our outlook? What are what are we gonna rally around? What are we gonna do? And of course, I think it's the same as it is every year. As a church body, our mission, of course, is to build our church. <laughs> to build our church. Because uh, the church is what Jesus has established to bring forth his word, the good news, into the world. All right? So we're not being selfish by building our church. We're being obedient by making an effort to build our church. And, you know, as I was thinking, I was specifically thinking, you know, because we have a, 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 a low number of young people, and I was thinking, especially teenage, you know, the ones that can make their own decisions, and I was sitting around thinking, what can, what can I do to get kids to come to church? That's when the correlation between church and trapping came to mind. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating we trap kids. Right? Not what I'm saying for <laughs> but I'm thinking the wisdom fits the same way. I'm going to tie some of this in this morning. And it fits for all people, not just kids, okay? So let's look, first of all, the, uh, the, the theme of the message this morning, Acts chapter 4, and verse 47. In Acts, there is no chapter, verse 47. <laughs> and it's not 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Told you we've got fun this morning. We're already playing. Look around the bottom. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 47, which makes more sense than the verse that doesn't exist, says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to, uh, to bail me out of that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Thank you, God, that we can come to church and worship you. Thank you that we can laugh and we can, we can relax and have fun. Look into your word and see what you have for us, Father. Encourage us this morning. Speak to our hearts, Father. Motivate us to do what you have us to do this year. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so let's look at our, 
our, our tracking outline there that I gave you in the, minute, in, uh, in the beginning. And I'm going to tie this into some scripture. You've got to get moving here. First of all, you've got to place the trap in an area where animals are. Now, I've learned from watching these guys on the TV show that I was telling you about that they don't just go out into the woods and put a trap anywhere. See, they do scouting first, and they go around, and they and they, one of them is a beaver trap. So he'll go out to these lakes and ponds and the rivers, and, and he knows what to look for. He knows where the, uh, the, the what looks like a big pile of debris to us is actually a, a beaver den, and he knows the, the tracks that they make, and he finds an area where there's a lot of animals already. And the other guy, the trap professional, he does the same thing. He looks for animal signs, all right? And so they put their trap where the animals that they're looking to catch are, all right? And they don't just put them anywhere. Now, the verse that we read in the beginning, let me put some correlation here, uh, from Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, said, uh, uh, the, uh, was, was talking about the beginning of the organized church. All right. Now, of course, we know that, that Jesus founded the church during his life and ministry, but this is where it began to get organized. When the Holy Spirit had fell upon them at Pentecost and things started coming together and, and, and organizing, this is what was going on here in, uh, in the, the beginning of the book of Acts. Where, now, I want you to notice where it started was in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In the very same place where Christ the Savior had been crucified. The very same place where, where just a short time before these, these apostles who in the beginning of the book of Acts start coming out and boldly preaching the word were hiding in fear for their life. But now the power of God had come upon them and they started organizing the church and they started preaching with a boldness given to them by the Holy Spirit that came into their life. And it started in Jerusalem, which, not by any coincidence, was the, the hub of Jewish activity. Now remember, the church had to go to the Jewish community first. Scripture says that it went to the Jews and then stretched out to the Gentiles. And so it makes perfect sense that it would start right there in Jerusalem, where the temple was, where, as a matter of fact, at this time, people from all over the Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And uh, that had, had gone past, but, uh, you know, it was a hub of, of Jewish activity, and they were all right there. The church was designed to reach out to them first. <clears throat> now, missionaries from there, like Paul, Barnabas, and others that we read about as we go into Acts, we go out from there and begin to spread the gospel to surrounding areas. And it happened in other ways too. As a matter of fact, some persecution actually ended up spreading as we go through. But it started in Jerusalem and then it spread out to other areas. And, uh, you know, Paul would go, if we follow his missionary journey, he would go to a town, set up a church. Go to a town, set up a church. Over and over and over, he did that. And he would go back around and check on them. Now, as the church was getting started, there was no problem finding people who needed to hear the gospel, was it? Because it was brand new. Christ had just had his ministry. He had just died and paid the debt for everybody's sin. And the church was getting started. So, so literally everybody needed to hear the gospel. Now, on the contrary, in our area, everybody is saved and going to church every Sunday, right? No, no, it doesn't work that way. That, that's wrong. The, there's no bad place to have a church, is there? Even when there's one on every corner, because there's lost, hurting, broken people everywhere. <coughs> and we are in a good spot. There's no bad spot. All right? So that's why we're, we're, we're setting the trap, right? Put our trap in a good spot. The correlation. Now, now number two, you got to disguise the trap. If you're trapping, you've got to make the trap look non-threatening to the animal that's going to come. Because if you just, unlike the possums in my yard, I just put the trap out there, they'll go in. But ordinarily, these guys that do it for a living, they, they put their trap down, 
and they disguise it with stuff. They'll, they'll camouflage it with leaves or limbs or whatever, and it's, it's the right color. They even make sure that there's no stinky smell on it to, that would warn the animals that it's a trap, right? So they make it look just as comfortable as they can and non-threatening. Let me tell you, our churches physically should look as non-threatening as possible. Let me tell you, I'll get into this a little bit. This is why we keep it looking nice. We try to keep the building up. We try to keep uh, the, 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 the place clean and the grass cut. Because imagine if you're just a, a, a visitor, you're maybe you're new to a community and you're looking for somewhere to go to church and, and you know, you pass by and, the, and, the, and the, the weeds are all over the place and the grass is high and it looks like nobody's taking care of the place. Uh, does that look like a, a nice place to go? Or, you know, I'm probably going to drive right past that place. You know, it, just, it's, it would be unnatural to want to go there. But there's more to it than that. Right? That's just the physical surface of it, okay? There's more to it than that. See, most of us grew up in church. Most of us have never known the fear of stepping into a church house and wondering if we would be accepted at Most of us have, you know, but most of us have, would feel pretty comfortable stepping into a new church. But for many that did not grow up in a church or haven't been in a long time or don't look like the stereotypical church door, that fear is all too real. It's, it can be very intimidating for somebody to step into a church service wondering how the people in there are going to react to it. And I'm telling you, more and more and more, I've said this many times, that is the society outside of our church walls that did not grow up going into a church and, and don't feel comfortable walking in. But look, I'm proud to say that I've heard it multiple times from my friends that have been here. Zion Hill is a church that makes people feel welcome. You're doing an outstanding job of that. Thank you. Because I've been in some that were not. I've been in some churches myself that, and I probably made this statement before, it didn't look like the people that were in there wanted to be there, and it didn't look like they wanted you to be there either. <laughs> what a shame. For the house of God to not be somewhere where, where someone can feel welcome to come in. And comfortable to come in. Look, there, the word of God is sometimes going to make people uncomfortable. And it should. But we should do our best to make them feel as good as they can about being there. And not only that, we're commanded to in scripture. You know, common sense should tell us to do that. But the Bible does too. Uh, and I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures. I've got a mark so I can get there quickly. Romans chapter 15 and verse 7. Scripture says this. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ received us to the glory of God. How did Christ receive us into his glory? With a welcome arm. Yeah. That everybody was welcome. All right. Now. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9 says this. Now this gets right to the heart of the matter. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? Use hospitality to one another without grudging. Right? So we're commanded to make our church a comforting environment for people to come into. Now, now number three, let's get back to our, our trapping illustration again for a second. You gotta make a funnel. There's something I never really thought about, but the pros always do it. You see, when they set their trap, they set it down there, they camouflage it up, but, but then they'll make something to, to guide the target animal into the trap. Like they'll, you know, if the trap's here and they're in the woods, they'll pile up debris here. It won't look like very much, and, and the animal could, he could jump over it. He could go all the way around it. But when it comes along, the most natural thing for them is to just go right into it. See, it's like a it's like a guiding them into the trap. It makes it look like the most inviting path. Now, churches, including us, do things to funnel people toward the church. Don't they? It's called outreach activities, things that we do, extracurricular things. And there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with 
with it. We need these things to help create interest, don't we? And we do. We do some of these, such as, uh, uh, I'm just remembering back over the time that I've been here, some of the things that we've done, uh, the, the trunk or treat was, was real successful. People from all over came to, uh, to, to enjoy that. It was, a, it was a, an outreach of something extra that we do. Vacation Bible School was that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's for the, the, the building and the educating of our young people, but it's an outreach, too. And lots of young people who don't come to our church regularly came to Vacation Bible School. Um, things that we do in the neighborhood to reach out. Game time at Awana is this. You ever realize that in our Awana program, uh, we have uh, uh, a lesson time and a memory time and a game time. Game time is the part that draws children in. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, think about this. Even the sign and the church website is extra. It's things that we do to reach out to draw people in, to say, hey, this, this is a good place to go. Our Facebook page is in there. Now, let me say this. I'm going to tie all this together in a minute. A successful church is usually an active church. If you go to a church that, 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 that nothing is ever going on besides ordinary Sunday morning worship, and, and personally, I enjoy ordinary Sunday worship myself, but, but there needs to be extra stuff. An active church. Growing church is usually doing extra things to keep people involved. And even us adults like to have fun, don't we? Like movie night tonight. We're just going to have some fun. Look, it's marketing. It's, it's gimmicks, if you will. Gimmicks are not a bad thing, but they're not the most important thing. <coughs> even the way we act is a funnel towards the church. Remember in our scripture that we looked at in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, uh, the, the statement was in there having favor with all the people. Do you know how we act outside the church either draws people to our church or repels them away from it? We're part of the problem. All right, so let me tie this together. We, we have, a, have a trap in a good spot here. We got well disguised, camouflaged up. We made a funnel, but it seems like I'm forgetting something. Bait. You gotta have, you gotta have bait. It's the most important thing. You see, in, in trapping, it's possible to to uh, to do not so good of a job with the other three. You know, maybe you didn't uh, put the trap in the best spot. Maybe you didn't disguise it. Maybe you didn't even build a funnel. And you might still catch something if you have good bait. I'm sure that's what happens with my, uh, with my possums at the helm. But you can do the other three perfectly. And if you don't have good bait, you don't have much chance of catching anything. It's just not going to happen. Now I want to take the time right here to warn you of a trap that some churches fall into. This is something that we need to keep our eyes open to as a church to make sure that we're watching for it. And it's the trap of mistaking gimmicks for bait. Now, let me say this. It's discouraging to see low numbers in the church. I understand. It's discouraging when, especially when, when we're inviting others, when, when we're asking people, look, I've been I've been trying to get people to come to church since I've been entering in here, which is getting close to a year, uh, a few months short. And it's discouraging when people don't show up or they come and then they go away. And they don't, I, I get it. And it's tempting to become a gimmick-driven ministry. You see, because when we, when we do something big, we draw people in, and that's exciting, and it is tempting to get to where we want to have a gimmick for everything. Uh, every Sunday becomes like a circus. Every sermon uh, has, a, uh, has a, a title, and it's part of a series, and it's advertised. And the dinner on the grounds once a month. None of that's bad things. Not at all. None of that's bad if we keep it in the right context. Let me tell you. See, the problem comes in when we get the idea that gimmicks and activities are going to build a church. Gimmicks and activities don't build churches. 
Do we have a natural desire to see things happen in the dorm? Sure, we do. I'm the same way. I'd love to see this place explode and fill up with people. And every pew be full, that would be great. And I, and I get discouraged when, when some of my friends uh, who visited said they came back. Didn't. Or didn't come at all. And I thought sometimes in desperation, I've got to do something. I've got to bring people in. I've learned something. I can't. I can't. See, let me get back to my illustration for a second and trap me. Even when everything is done, when you did everything perfect, the trap's in a great place and it's disguised and it's falling and you've got great bait. Sometimes the animal just doesn't come. You don't always get something. What I have to do is remind myself sometimes. And I want to remind you as well. Church growth is most always a slow process. Now, sure, sometimes churches explode and fill up real fast, and, and sometimes that brings problems, growing pains, if you will. But here's the key. Don't panic. Use the perfect bait. Stick to it. Stick to it. Oh, yeah, the bait. God's word. The bait is God's word. It's what people need. Yeah. It's what people are searching for, even if they don't know it yet. If we stand firm on the Word of God Amen. as our foundation, we learn it, we teach it, we proclaim it, then we add the gimmicks and the activities and the building and the welcoming atmosphere. Well, let me show you from this Word what will happen. In our key verse, verse 47 said, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily that should be saved. Who added to the church? The Lord. Can't be me, and can't be you. We have our part to play, but the Lord asked the church. Let me back up here. I'm going to show you Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus Christ said this. He was talking to Peter. He said, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I will build my church, Christ said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who builds the church? Christ builds yeah. the church. Now, to tell you one more thing, you got to check your traps to keep what you got. <laughs> These trappers, when they trap, they got to come around. And, and they'll get their stuff out of the trap quick because, you know, if it's a, if it's a live trap, an animal will do some crazy things to get out of the trap and get away. All right? That's not a good correlation with the church, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but if an animal is caught in the trap, other things will come and get it out of there. And that's the point I want to make. There's this one guy on the show, named, his name's Marty. He, he's in Alaska. He's way out in the woods. And he's always having trouble with wolverines. Come and get his stuff. He's all the wolverines and he tries to catch the wolverines too because the wolverines will come and get his, his stuff out of his traps and steal it away from him. Let me tell you this morning, our adversary, the devil, does not want people in our church. He does not. And when they get here, he will try his best to tear them away. We can't force people to stay in order we want to force people to stay. But we need to try to encourage them. We try to try to encourage them. When new folks come and they will, it's important that we encourage them to get involved. Just a reminder. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to show you some more verses of the scripture uh, in Acts real quick and we'll, and we'll be done. Acts chapter 2. If you want to turn your with me real close to where we were at. Back to verse 41. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and the prayers. You see what they did? They come in, they were baptized, and they got included. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine 
fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. They didn't just get people saved and, and then leave them out in the community. They involved them in what they were doing. You made them a part. All right. Let's wrap this up. Well, building, building our church should be our goal, right? For the new year and always. And we have a part to play in that. But it's important that we keep it in the forefront of our mind all the time that God is the one in control. God is the one in control. Like, like Paul said, Paul said, I planted, Paul is watered, but God gave the increase. And he will give the increase. It would, it would be awesome if it takes off like a rocket, but it might not. Let me ask you this. This is my challenge this morning. Can we keep plugging away even if growth is slow? Can we keep in the fire? I remember one time a missionary come to the church that I was a member of and we were having a big ministry outreach and uh, he sat us down and was, uh, was talking to the church beforehand and, uh, and basically he said, you know, we expect a lot of people to come to the Lord through this ministry. Because, you know, you're taking the step and you're reaching out. He said, but let me ask you this. He said, what if, what if only 10 people come to know the Lord? Was it worth it? And, of course, everybody said, yeah, yeah, it was, it was worth it. We did. And he said, what if only five? Kind of sounded like that old, uh, old Testament story. <laughs> he got, finally got down. He said, what if nobody comes to Christ this weekend? Is it still worth it what you're doing? That really brought it to the ground because... It wasn't up to, it's only up to us to do the work that God gives us to do. It's up to God to give the increase. All right? We do the work regardless. You know, sometimes it takes a long time. Let me give you one more illustration. And I promise I'll be done in just a minute. It, may, it reminds me of, of the, uh, the people that, how they must have felt sailing on the ships across the ocean a long tobacco in sailor ship time. I, I looked this up. The Mayflower that came from England to the to the United States, or what the United States yet, that came here, took 66 days to make that trip. Over two months out on the ocean <coughs> and nothing you can see but water. <coughs> Sometimes it must have felt to them like they're not getting anywhere at all. And then one day, all of a sudden, there was land, and they had crossed an entire ocean. You know, one day we're going to look back and we'll see how far we are. You who have been here a long time, you probably already can. But we're going to look back, and we're, we're taking little steps, and sometimes it feels like things are going at a snail pace. But we're going to look back, and we're going to see what God has done. It's going to be a great thing. With a bud from musicians, would you go ahead and start making your way to the front? I'm confident that God is going to do some awesome things here in this church in 2019. And I can't wait to see what it's going to be. And I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of it. But let's start it off on the right foot. Let me ask you this morning. Do you know, do you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your person? Can you go back in time to a point where you said, this is where I asked Christ to come in and forgive me my sin? Because he died on the cross to pay the penalty and make a free gift. Whoever, what we said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. If you're not, would you call on him this morning as we gather for this invitation? Anything else that needs to be done? If you want to join and be a member, if you, uh, how about a time to pray? <laughs> Ask God what He'd have you to do this upcoming year. Whatever business you have to do with God, let's, let's stand together. Five hundred people.